Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Silicon Global Online series. Uh, today we have Bob Ackerman, who is a cyber venture capitalist. He's known as Cyber's Money Man, even. I've known Bob for, for many, many years, uh, back before Allegis Cyber Capital, but we're going to hear all about uh, how Allegis Cyber Capital is formed, what they're doing, uh, what the roadmap is for the future. It's going to be a really exciting hour. So get your questions ready for Bob. We're going to go getting to those toward the last half hour of the show. And we're going to start with a conversational chat beforehand. Now, let me just say a few words about Silicon Dragon. Some of you have been on our show before. Uh, that's uh, me here in the middle. Um, and then uh, we have our whole platform of offerings. As you can see, we have our videos. Actually, we're gonna be recording this today. So you'll be able to see it in an archive basis as well. But today's the only day that you can actually ask Bob a question. So today's the day to be on. Uh, we have a mobile app, we've got our newsletter, we have our circle membership. And uh, so we're all about content around venture capital and investment and startups and tech. And of course, this all relates to some of my books that I've had published. Uh, so a new one is coming up. Uh, it'll be my fourth one, four and a half, because I wrote a chapter for another chapter for another book. But these are my three main ones right here, uh, starting in 2008. Uh, so here we go. Uh, circle membership. All of you know about the circle membership. And if you sign up, you get all of our events, even into next year, on a complimentary basis. So next, I'm going to bring uh, Bob on and uh, introduce him. So hey, Bob, how are you doing? Uh, Rebecca, it's great. It's great to see you. And it's, uh, it's fun uh, having known each other as long as we have to be able to do this together. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm so glad you're able to do this. And uh, Bob is joining us from Wyoming. Where 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 the vaccine is at bay, so uh, <laughs> everybody okay. everybody's pretty healthy out here. So oh, very part, part good. of the great open west. Oh yeah, we love it. We love it. Um, I have some relatives who are from Wyoming, some great uncles who moved out there from Ohio, and uh, have ranch land in Wyoming. Also, my brother in law is from Wyoming. Well, you, you, Wyoming you, you've got to get out here and visit. So. Oh, I know. I, I've been a few times, but not recently. I've been traveling more in the Midwest recently and yeah. California, of course. Okay, so let me introduce Bob. Uh, Bob set up Allegis Cyber as the first cybersecurity focused venture firm in the world. And they are running the first dedicated cybersecurity investment funds. His portfolio is really packed. I think it's as many as 50 companies. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right, Bob, 50? It's about right, yeah. Okay, and a number of those are unicorns. In another part of his life, uh, Bob runs Data Tribe, which is a cybersecurity foundry. And we'll hear all about that. We'll hear what he means by foundry. But he has started three disruptive cybersecurity and data science companies each year he's doing this. And they're based on R&D coming out of the US intelligence community and US national labs. Uh, so we have a lot to talk about. And um, so I'm gonna start right now and um, just ask Bob to tell us a little bit more about what Allegis Cyber Capital is all about and why you started it and how's it going? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's been quite a, quite a journey. Uh, I think as you, as you know, we've been investing in cybersecurity for, uh, for about 20 years. And, uh, you know, turned out uh, we were pretty, were pretty good at it. And we had an observation, actually was generated by one of our investors about, about nine years ago, an institutional investor. And he said, have you ever, you ever thought about focusing just on cybersecurity? It seems like you guys are, are pretty good. And, you know, it's, for, for a venture guy, that's a, that's a pretty interesting question because if you make a decision to focus uh, on something, you, you, you run the risk of potentially end up in a cul-de-sac with a pretty narrow focus. And so... We had to really assess for ourselves how big we thought cyber was. And when people talk about focus, they tend to think in terms of verticals. And our realization, kind of the breakthrough aha moment was cyber is not vertical. It's broadly horizontal. Uh, everywhere there is a microprocessor and there is data, there is cyber risk and cyber exposure. Uh, and, and so we took that observation combined with the fact that 
you know, our experience in cyber up to that point in time had demonstrated it moves very fast. It's technically very complex. And, and our conviction was, look, if you're going to be in cyber, you can't do it part time. Uh, you, you really need to focus. You need to build the expertise. You need to be able to anticipate, you know, borrowing from Wayne Gretzky where the puck is going to be. And so uh, about eight years ago, we went all in uh, and, and basically shifted our focus 100 percent to cybersecurity. Uh, as you indicated, we were the first firm in the world to kind of make that leap. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of people thought we were, uh, that was a little niche I don't think they think cyber is niche anymore. Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the back of that, we raised the first dedicated cyber venture funds uh, in the world. And uh, it's just, it's, it's been a great opportunity for us. But I think the, you know, that, that, that observation that it is very complex and it does move very quickly uh, has just been reinforced in our experience over the years. And, and, and really kind of validated that decision to focus on, on cyber and to build the expertise where we can anticipate, uh, you know, where the threats are likely to go. Um, you know, and the, the Allegis platform is classically an early stage platform. Uh, so we're sort of series A to series C is where we tend to operate. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you represent, you know, you, you reference Data Tribe, uh, which we, uh, we started about six years ago. And we had a, an observation, I think, that was probably reasonably unique to us, which is basically in the world of cybersecurity, every threat that we deal with today, at some point in time, draws its inspiration from offensive playbooks, nation state offensive playbooks. And our thinking was, look, if you're going to build, and those offensive playbooks tend to run about five to six years ahead of where the defense, state of the art in defense is. And so our kind of aha moment was, why don't you just take the guys that wrote those offensive playbooks and, and say, okay, I want you to take all that expertise and I want you to figure out how to stop sneaky bastards like you yeah. uh, and, and flip the playbook and put them on defense. Um, and, and that turned out to be a really useful insight. Uh, and for, uh, for a, a couple of years, we would pull teams out of Maryland, principally out of the National Security Agency that had that offensive background. Uh, we'd relocate them out to Silicon Valley uh, and, you know, companies like uh, Area One with Orrin Falkowitz or Jay Kaplan at Synac, great examples of that DNA and that playbook at work. And about six years ago, it just got to the point where it wasn't possible to relocate those engineers from Maryland to the West Coast. You know, typically an engineer leaving the National Security Agency has been there. It ranges, let's, let's call it seven to 12 years. They're married, they've got kids. Uh, they have a home, they make about $138,000 a year. Uh, and trying to replicate that in Silicon Valley about six years ago, that just was not going to happen. Right. Uh, I, could, I could triple their compensation and I could not replicate uh, their, uh, you know, their lifestyle. Sure. Uh, and, and so we were you know, kind of at a quandary in terms of what do we do? I had been spending more time in Maryland, uh, you know, just looking for opportunities. And uh, my partner, Mike Janke on Data Tribe, we just... Uh, we had pulled some technology out of out of the NSA, sold the company six months later. Uh, you know, phenomenal success in Maryland, but you know, we we sold what I thought was a billion dollar company for about fifty million dollars. Everybody in Maryland's doing high fives, and I'm crying in my beer, saying we just sold a billion dollar idea for fifty million dollars. I remember telling Mike that ain't ever going to happen again. We will not let that happen again. Oh, and 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 so our response was, what do we need to do to stop that from happening? We have to build you know, an ecosystem to build these companies in Maryland. And uh, given that their, that ecosystem did not exist in Maryland, uh, you know, our response was Data Tribe. And it basically was, let's take capital, let's take all of our startup operating experience, let's take the Silicon Valley playbook, let's take our network of customers around the world and advisors, let's drop them in a box, let's call it Data Tribe, and let's put it next to Fort Meade. And uh, that's turned out to be a, uh, a great, great, opportunity. And, and we describe Data Tribe as a, as a foundry, uh, kind of borrowing the metaphor of forging things from raw material. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll basically work with a team of engineers that maybe come out of the National Security Agency, have been on the offensive side or been on the data science team. They are domain masters. They've, they've developed their expertise, you know, with the benefit of massive U.S. government investment over decades developing state-of-the-art capabilities. So they really are the best of the best. Uh, but most of the time, they have absolutely no experience with business. Uh, there's, there's no Silicon Valley ethos that can help guide them on that journey. 
Uh -huh. uh, and, and so we tried to put everything that we knew about building companies together and give them a landing spot so that, you know, when, when three engineers leave the NSA that want to start a company, we're there to provide not just their capital, but to provide all of their infrastructure. Uh, we've got a dedicated operating team of, of startup pros that have got 20 to 25 years of experience yet that embed within these companies uh, and, and basically take them from technical capability and concept through to having a validated business that's ready for Series A financing. And as you indicated, we do that about three times a year. Uh, and the things that we work on are very unique. Uh, again, they're always inspired by that offensive perspective. They tend to be ahead of the market, uh, but uh, we like that. We like highly differentiated next generation, what I describe as over the horizon opportunities. And, and you, you find that in Maryland, you know, the, the US government, Maryland in, from a cybersecurity perspective actually looks a lot like Silicon Valley. Uh, if you go back to post-World War II, you remember the, the origins of Silicon Valley were, were really massive US government investment, primarily yeah. at Stanford and at Berkeley yeah. around core technologies to win the war effort. Yeah. And uh, after the war, they had this expertise. I was like, what do we do with this? Well, if you talk about cybersecurity, you find the same thing in Maryland where the government for decades has been investing tens of billions of dollars a year annually developing state-of-the-art capabilities. And, and you have the largest concentration of cyber engineering in the world in Maryland. You have 109,000 cyber engineers, 16 cyber centers of excellence. Wow. The University of Maryland graduates with more cyber degrees than any other university system in the United States. So if cyber had a corporate headquarters, it would be in Maryland. Um, wow. So that's the good news on the technical side. On the, on the commercialization side, there just isn't that tradition of startup success. There are some notable exceptions, but there hasn't been that tradition of startup success. And that's the curve we're trying to bend on the data tribe side, but that's really our, our seed activity. Allegis is the early stage portion of the platform. Uh, and then um, we have a sister fund led by my partner, uh, Dave DeWalt, who was the CEO of, of uh, uh, McAfee and FireEye. And okay. Dave, uh, Dave's got Night Dragon, which is our growth equity platform that picks up after, uh, you know, Allegis tends to, you know, kind of tap out at about Series C. Night Dragon kicks in and does growth equity. So we've actually stitched a platform together that allows us to invest collectively in this federation at any stage, anywhere in the world. And the idea is to be able to apply our knowledge and leverage our expertise and our, our relationships to identify the most promising, most disruptive cyber companies, and then have a, an element of the platform that can engage with a company at any stage of development. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, we, we continue to innovate, even though we're in the business of funding innovation, <laughs> we try to continue to innovate, you know, within the venture ecosystem as well. Sure. Well, can you give some examples of some of these companies that you've basically invested in or, well, or I think, incubated I mean, I think, or you know, one had the, one in a foundry the, system. Yeah, probably. probably or had one in ones. a foundry system. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll pick. I'll pick Dragos. Um, okay. You know, and Dra Dragos is in industrial control system security. So these are the guys that secure manufacturing facilities, pipelines, electrical grids. And uh, you know, we started that company pretty close to six years ago now. At this point in time, uh, with um, you know oh. Rob Lee and his two co-founders coming out of the National Security Agency. And they really led the NSA's offensive capability uh, in industrial control systems. So if for whatever reason, uh, a U.S. government policymaker decided that, you know, the, the, the power needed to go out in, in an adversarial country, these were the guys that, that had that expertise to, to go after industrial control systems. Industrial control systems are very, very different than traditional IT systems. And there was sort of an aha moment for the, the, the team when the Russians took down the Ukrainian power grid uh, and they did it not once, but they did it twice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the, the U S government's response was we got to figure out what just happened uh, because you know, we we've seen an offensive use of, of cyber technology uh, to take an adversary in this case, the Ukrainians offline. How did they do that? What are the implications? What can we learn from that? And so Rob and, and his co-founders being the core of the offensive team flipped to defense. And, and their task was to understand what just happened and what are the implications? What can we learn both from an offensive perspective, but also from a defensive perspective? And so sort of with that insight, uh, you, know, you know, shortly thereafter, they really decided it's like, 
this is going to be a new frontier in cyber and we need to get out and and build a defensive capability and so you know we we at data tribe we started with the three founders we provided their seed capital uh they actually move into our offices and lived with us uh, oh. for a little over a year um mm -hmm. our operating team embedded with them to you know to, to deal with those usual startup issues you know what are the use cases what's the product roadmap what's the go-to-market those aren't things they teach at the nsa but those are all essential disciplines to building a successful startup company and um, so we did that at uh, uh, we did that at uh, at Data Tribe, and when they were ready for their Series A financing, Allegis actually led the Series A financing. So it was a it's a good example of a company moving from the foundry into the more traditional venture platform. Uh, and you know, I you know my my perspective today, uh, this is a this is a company that will go the distance. Uh, you know, they they raised money last year. They're uh, you know, they're, everything they're doing is up and to the right. They are the ones that are securing really a lot of the U.S. electrical grid. Uh, but it's just, it's an example of, of what I call domain mastery. Uh, you know, they, they, they literally developed the playbook. Uh, and as a result, they have intimate knowledge of the technology of the market dynamics. They're respected by the customers. They're respected across the industry. You know, Rob Lee, the, the co-founder and CEO, um, you know, Rob actually wrote the original courses for the SANS Institute on industrial control system security. So Rob was the guy teaching the industry about ICS security. Uh, you know, Dragos last year was identified by the World Economic Forum as one of their technology pioneers. Rob is the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's industrial cyber group. He's on the on President Biden's advisory group. Uh, you know, Rob's one of those guys that I can put him with the most technical engineer in the world. The next day I can put him in front of the board of Southern company and the next day he'll be testifying to the U S Senate. So it's that, that concept of domain mastery yeah. is what we look for at, at data tribe, particularly when we're operating so far in advance of a market developing from a commercial perspective, we want that thought leadership. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you talked about how um, the offense of the defense, there's about a five year gap between them. So I'm just, you made me think about the Rumsfeld comment about uh, what are the uh, known unknowns? <laughs> right. and, and so uh, what are the known unknowns in your field? Uh, are there any like that? And what are the big threats out there that you're, that you're working on? Where are the big ideas needed? Well, I, I think, you know, if you, if, you, if you go back to the underlying premise in terms of what is, what is the foundation for innovation in the cyber industry? You know, we've, we've got the, the global economy basically digitizing as fast as it possibly can. Uh -huh. And, as, and as, as, as usual, what we find is that the, the innovation driving that initiative runs materially ahead of the security concer concerns and considerations. Many times security is an afterthought. I think we're slowly changing that culture, but many times it's the push for the efficiencies that go with digitization runs ahead of the, of the security concerns. And so you've, what you've got today is you've got this global push towards digitization and the, the, the push for that innovation is, is outpacing security, which leaves everything basically open and vulnerable. And in, in parallel with that digitization of our IT infrastructure that supports the global economy, we have in parallel with that, that digitization of the entire spectrum of bad human behavior. Uh, you know, so whether it's theft, whether it's extortion, whether it's, it's, you know, bank robbery, everything that you can think about in terms of bad human behavior, socially unacceptable behavior is also digitizing. And so those, those same bad actors are, are taking their expertise and they're digitizing and they become the threat actors in cybersecurity. So you have this good guy versus bad guy, you know, working at the speed of light to defend and exploit one another. It's a very, very interesting dynamic. And so one of the things that that, that means in, in our industry from a cyber innovation perspective is, is trying to, to understand, trying to anticipate <clears throat> where the new threats are likely to emerge. And so I'll give you an example. Um, at some point in time, um, you know, most of our infrastructure is gonna be as secure as it can be. That doesn't mean it's totally secure. But we will have we will have put endpoint in. We'll put we'll use artificial intelligence for detection. You know SDR XDR. We'll do all of these things, and that infrastructure is going to be about as secure as we can make it. Right. 
That doesn't mean the cyber threat stops. It just means the cyber threat moves to new areas, new areas of vulnerability. So one of the ones that, that I think about, uh, and a lot of this, quite frankly, um, we, we just we borrow from military tradecraft, um, will, will be weaponization of data. Uh, you know, right now, a lot of what we do in cybersecurity is we look for anomalies in our data. Uh, you know, things that stand out as being unusual or irregular as an indicator that there's potentially a threat that's developing or evolving. Well, at some point in time, uh, we're going to move to an environment where data itself is weaponized uh, and data is manipulated in order to achieve outcomes other than that which was intended. Now, that's an entirely new vector in terms of cyber threats. Imagine, I remember having a conversation with a, uh, with a, a significant global digital financial information provider about five years ago. Uh, and my observation was, well, today, you know, once upon a time, you published all your financial data and you would ship that financial data out to your customers uh, and it would be in analog form uh, and they would consume that data. Now you distribute it digitally uh, and that data goes out at the speed of light. It hits an automated trading system that trades on it immediately at the speed of light. How do you trust the data? How do you know the data hasn't been manipulated? How do you know the data hasn't been changed? And you know, the person I was talking to basically went white and said, that's the nightmare. How do we trust yeah. data? And that's the kind of stuff that'll slip right through all of our defensive technologies today. And so you start thinking about when you, when, when you sort of embrace that paranoid view of the future, which I don't think is paranoid. I think it's just where things are gonna go. In military tactics, we would call it disinformation. Um, how do you detect that? How do you defend against that? And so you start, it starts taking you into to areas uh, of data science that I think will actually have a huge impact on cybersecurity. Things like data provenance. How do I trust the data? Where did the data come from? Who's touched it? What's been changed? All getting to the point that yes, I can trust this data or no, I can't trust this data. So I think that's one of the, that's one of the big themes uh, that, that we think about. And interestingly enough, when you start talking about data provenance, you start talking about weaponization of data, um, that expertise doesn't exist in the commercial cyber industry. That information, that insight, that expertise is coming directly out of national security, uh, where they've had to develop these capabilities and develop these skills, uh, you know, driven by their tasks and their mission. And so, you know, it's a great example, again, of, of learning from offensive uh, mm -hmm. capabilities to inform where defensive companies need to get built. Mm -hmm. um, another example, another company we, uh, we, we started at, uh, at Data Tribe. We partnered with a phenomenal CEO, a lady by the name of Dr. Ellison Ann Williams. Mm -hmm. And Ellison Ann uh, was, uh, was from the NSA and she led the NSA's development efforts in an area of technology called homomorphic encryption. And you know, for, the, for the geeks with us today, homomorphic encryption has been sort of, the, sort of the holy grail of cybersecurity for 20 years. And the idea is that information can be processed while it's encrypted, so it's never exposed very complex, very sophisticated math. And, you know, IBM's been doing research in this area for about 20 years. They've got a, a reference implementation that functionally works, but nobody could ever crack the performance overhead attached with this. Well, when you take a, a technical leader like Ellison Ann Williams, who builds a phenomenal team around her and basically say, you've got unlimited budget. And by the way, it's about national security. Uh, amazing things get done. And so they actually, broke the code on homomorphic encryption and, and built homomorphic encryption implementations that were deployed globally within the national security agency operating at scale at speed nobody's ever done that before so when ellison ann was was ready to say okay i think there's commercial application for this technology uh she left the nsa the expertise in her team's mind and we started in veil with her at uh, at data tribe and it's it's just it's an example of someone who again a domain master who has got knowledge that is is unique and has been developed really in an r d facility when we think of the national security agency or we think of u.s national labs we don't view them as intelligence organizations we view them as laboratories r d centers that are phenomenally well funded developing expertise in areas that are very relevant to um uh, cybersecurity and its twin sister data science uh, and you know and that you know again it goes it goes back to that's what we uh, that's what we do at uh, at data tribe and 
I think we've, uh, I think we've started 13 companies at this point in time, uh, touch wood, you know, all of them have been successful to date. Uh, you know, you, you know, law of averages tells you that that's not going to be the case forever. Yeah. But, but again, but the things we're working on are, have been backed by massive amounts of research. They're very innovative and they really are about what's over the horizon. You know, what are the things that we need to have down the road in order to be more cyber secure? Right. So are you concerned uh, about the Chinese catch up to the U.S. in national R&D spending? Well, look, I, I think there's 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 a couple of different ways to look at that. Uh, you know, from the, the, I've got a cyber hat on and, and obviously one of the one of the significant protagonists in the cyber world, uh, you know, is the Chinese. There are you know, but they're not they're not alone. They're not unique. There are 135 identified nation state actors with serious cyber capabilities, you know, and, and, and cyber is pretty damn attractive from a nation state perspective. I mean, North Korea, for less than the price of a tank, can stand up a pretty, you know, capable cyber capability. Uh, and that and that's just the reality, you know, sort of the asymmetric nature of cyber. So you, you certainly have to acknowledge the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, but a host of other players as, as you know, cyber actors that represent a threat uh, to, to the U.S. and how that threat manifests itself, uh, you know, is, is multifold. And it may be, uh, you know, it may be industrial espionage. It, 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 there's a whole spectrum of, of use cases, if you will, or attack vectors that cyber employs. There's a whole nother side of the equation, you know, an expansion of that, uh, where you look at, 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 at great power competition. Uh, and the role of cyber in that great power competition and the Chinese and the US uh, are, are a really good example of that working you know, at, uh, at scale. And you know, over the last couple of years, we've, we've heard a lot about this, this Chinese theft of intellectual property. Uh, look, this has been going on for 20 years. This is not something that's happened in the last two years. It's just gotten to a scale that, that it, it finally is registering uh, I would argue it, was, it should have registered 15 years ago. It was pretty damn obvious, mm -hmm. but but cyber turns out to be very effective. Or how do you compromise an organization? How do you identify their proprietary technology and ex, you know and exfiltrate that proprietary technology and then use that technology to compress your own R&D cycle to compete economically with the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. And look, we've got in the U.S. we've got a phenomenal research and development capability. It really is innovation is what powers our economy globally. And that's a byproduct of this, this innovation culture, this entrepreneurial culture, but this R&D culture. Uh, and there are actors around the world that want to want to compete with us economically. And, you know, there's, there's two ways to do that. Fund their own research and development and try and catch up. Or if you can, steal ours and, you know, compress the, the learning curve and reduce the costs. And there are actors in the world that are using cyber to target our organizations and to, you know, frankly, steal our intellectual property or knowledge associated with how we operate our businesses, and then to use that data, you know, to compete with us economically in the world. So that's that's a that's a real threat to the U.S. economy, uh, because if, if you look at the U.S. economy, if we lose that advantage, what do we fall back on? Where do we go from there? Uh, you know, and particularly if you look at the, you know, if, if you look at the those sort of the global economics. You look at the massive deficits we're running, you know, at, at, a, at a nation state level, um, not a lot of margin for error. And, and so, you know, I would argue that this issue around intellectual property, securing our intellectual property, securing our systems that envelop that intellectual property really is a national security priority. And mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those great nation state battles that we cannot afford to lose. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're really focused on a lot of the government. What about the corporation's role in innovating in the cybersecurity area, like Microsoft and all these tech giants out there? Are they kind of how, where? How do they factor in? Well, look, I mean, there all all of this expertise has to get to the broader commercial market, right? Uh, and so we may take some inspiration from these offensive capabilities and this R and D capability at a nation state level, but at the end of the day, our focus is principally on the commercial market. You know, we are, we are not starting companies to focus on selling to the government. A lot of our companies do sell to the government, right. but that's not our primary focus. It's the commercial market. And, and when, you, when you look at cyber and that dynamic, what you understand is what the nature of cybersecurity is it is very technically complicated and it moves very, very fast. 
uh, you know, this is innovation on a flywheel and it just goes as fast as it possibly can. Good guys versus bad guys. You know, the bad guys, just as smart as the good guys, sometimes better motivated uh, to be, you know, less constrained in how they respond. So you've got this, this dynamic of innovation that drives cybersecurity. So it moves very, very quickly. Now, what that means uh, is, is that innovation in order to be successful has to move at a very, very rapid pace. And I think what we've seen is that most large companies struggle to innovate as fast as they need to innovate uh -huh. to remain competitive in cybersecurity. So what, what that's, what, what's happened as a result of that is you've got this very interesting ecosystem that's developed where small startup cyber companies really drive innovation because they are lean, they are efficient, they succeed quickly or they fail quickly. Either one of those is okay, right? Yeah. But once they once they validate their innovation and they get some commercial traction, though the vast majority of those companies are successful will be acquired by the big tech company that has established customer relationships, established brand, but has yeah. a has a product pantry that's bare. And so they'll step into the startup ecosystem, they'll acquire the innovation, they pay a premium for that innovation, which is advantage the cyber entrepreneur. Uh, you know, cyber, cyber companies, when they're acquired, tend to get acquired at about a 30 to 35% premium to enterprise software company valuations. Another good reason to be in cyber. Uh, but they'll be acquired uh, by, uh, by large tech companies who are looking for growth. And cyber is that big growth opportunity, you know, in IT. But it's never one and done because the, the nature of the entrepreneur in cyber is one that lives on innovation, particularly these ones that that come out of places like the National Security Agency. They are wired to innovate. And the idea that they're gonna sit still and manage, you know, maintain code and do incremental enhancements, not in the culture, just not in the culture. So they get acquired. Uh, I would guarantee you probably day two after the acquisition, the, the champagne hangover has worn off and they start thinking about what they're gonna do next. Sure. Uh, and so you see a lot of serial entrepreneurs and they know that that big company that acquired them and all the big companies like them are going to be back looking to refresh the pot product pantry on an ongoing basis. So you got this really interesting virtuous cycle that 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 creates, you know, a higher level of exit opportunity for cyber startups. Uh, just because if you look at IT, the largest growth opportunity in information technology is cyber. Uh, you know, when other segments of the marketplace are maturing, they're seeing margin compression. Certainly you have things like cloud computing, which represents a growth opportunity, but you know, the IT industry is at a level of maturity that it's not providing the growth that it did, let's say 15 years ago, but cyber is providing that growth within IT. So if you're an IBM, a Microsoft, you know, you, uh, you know Juniper, you, you name it, right? Palo Alto Networks. What you'll see is they're very active in the marketplace in terms of acquiring innovation, particularly in cyber, to fuel the gaps in the product pantry. Yeah. So um, I imagine you have quite a few acquisitions among your portfolio companies. We 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 do, but I'll tell you, we're 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 uh, we may be uh, our look. Our, our team are all ex operators. Um, I always I tell people, look, I'm not a finance guy. Uh, you know, I build companies for a living, and that really is the culture of our firm. Our our team all have startup backgrounds, so we're not the we're not the what's become the more typical. Uh, you know, venture model. Uh, you know, before I jumped into venture 25 years ago, I built two companies as an entrepreneur. So we're wired as entrepreneurs. We're wired to identify opportunities where we can build companies long term. We're not trying to in for three years and out. It's like find mm -hmm. ideas where we can build big companies on a sustainable basis, mm -hmm. and we'll ride them as long as we possibly can. Uh, you know, along the way, in cyber, you have to understand because that market moves so quickly. There are times you say, look, that was a really good idea, but the market's not moving in that direction. Let's exit that investment and let's redeploy those resources into another area where we think there's a lot of growth. And so you, you need to be very agile, uh, you know, in cybersecurity. Um, I mean, if you look at, look at the data, I mean, the size of this market, first half of this year, $11.5 billion went into cybersecurity investments. That's like a, that's, that's a, that's a more than, it's close to a 200% increase year over year. Uh, you know, you had close to $40 billion uh, in M&A transactions in the first half of this year, which is up from, I think, if I'm remembering close, oh, 
from maybe 9.5 billion last year. This is all data from Momentum Cyber, which is one of our affiliates that does a lot of data uh, with respect to the cyber industry. So it's a, it's a huge growth opportunity, uh, which is what attracts all of this venture capital. You got a big market, you know, it's, it's a market that's uncorrelated. Uh, you know, if the NASDAQ was off 50% tomorrow, cyber budgets aren't getting slashed. Cyber budgets move in one direction, up and to the right, because the cyber threat just continues to expand. Now, the challenge that that creates is, is you know, and, and, and it's not a cyber issue, it's a venture capital industry, is that the venture industry, whenever it identifies a hot segment where value is being created, man, money flows into that segment like there's no end of tomorrow. Uh, and, and it tends to be a little indiscriminate. Uh, in how it moves in. And so what you find is that uh, there is there, there, there can be the propensity to overcapitalize undifferentiated innovation. I get asked all the time, you know, is cyber with these numbers, is cyber overcapitalized? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, the, the, the commodity stuff, let's, let's pick one, threat intelligence. Uh, you know, there's 100 plus threat intelligence companies. Do we need 100 plus threat intelligence companies? No, you know, five will probably do the job. Uh, but when the venture herd moves in, it, it, you know, it sort of does its sectorization and identifies, well, here's a category, it's called threat intelligence, let's get into threat intelligence, and it will overcapitalize threat intelligence. Now, the flip side of that is that there are areas where we tend to focus, we hope we tend to focus, like industrial control system security or homomorphic encryption or some of these other things, which are not obvious, and they only become apparent to us because we live in this market 100% of the time. And so we'll identify things, uh, and I'll give you an example in a moment, it's kind of funny. Uh, we'll identify things that are not obvious and that's where we'll be deploying our company. And that's the stuff that's gonna make the big difference four or five, six years from now. Those areas tend to be undercapitalized because unless you live in this space, it's not gonna be apparent. Uh, you know, you're not going to understand the use case and why the use case is compelling, or what the likely timing is, or or how the go to market is going to develop, and where the low hanging fruit will be, and where you can build revenues near term while you wait for the bigger market to develop. You know, I, I, I talked about Dragos earlier as as I, I think one of the most exciting companies in the cyber industry, an entirely new category, and uh, you know, in terms of industrial security. And when we were doing Dragos the Series A financing. Um, I, I, uh, I talked to probably 10 of my good friends in venture that are cyber specialists. And there's a, that cyber actually turns out to be a very small, if you look at people that have been in cyber for 15 years, there's like 10 of us, you know, it's a very small group of folks. And, and I remember, I remember the, the, the reaction that I got from people is like, Bob, it's in Maryland. I said, yeah, that's where the expertise is. I said, but it's industrial. Nobody makes money industrial. And my point was, Cyber is going to change everything you thought about industrial, you know, because all of a sudden cyber has not been a problem in industrial, but it's going to become a problem in industrial because I've seen the offensive playbooks and all of that offensive playbook is going to get into the wild and it's going to become part of the threat landscape that we're dealing with. But that was not, that was not conventional wisdom when we, when we made that investment, but we had deep conviction and a lot of that deep conviction came from our ability to look through the offensive lens at where cyber threats were going and understanding that they weren't gonna be static, they're very dynamic. And that the adversary, his full-time job is to look for vulnerabilities that can be exploited for any of a spectrum of reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and, but that was not conventional wisdom within Silicon Valley when I was talking to those, those uh, venture firms. So. Yeah, so are you competing for deals? Are you chasing deals, competing with other venture firms? Well, uh, you know, it depends. One of the look, one of the reasons, one of the reasons I like early stage venture um, is, is that things are not as obvious early mm -hmm. as they are when you get to that growth stage. You know, if a company hits that growth stage uh, or financing, it's pretty damn obvious what success they've had and what their trajectory looks like. That's much more competitive. Personally, that's not my skill set. That's not where our team tends to operate. You know, I think if you're operating at that growth stage, you need to have hardcore operating chops. I think Dave DeWalt and the Night Dragon team are exceptionally gifted at that because they're all operators. They've been, they built big multi-billion dollar cyber companies. They know how to do that. We like the early stage stuff where it's, it's, it's a lot more hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's a lot more crafting a company, you know, from a concept, uh, a chance to frankly, from our perspective, add more of a different kind of value. Um, do we see competition there? 
yeah, because more money floods into the system. At some level, it does tend to lift all boats. But you go back and you look at what we do with Data Tribe, that's 100% proprietary deal flow. Those are companies that we started. Uh, and, and we got very, on, very early on, very comfortable starting companies, not sitting in our office waiting for a parade of entrepreneurs to wander through the office and say, yeah, I like that one. It's like, no, we have an idea and, and a company needs to be here and, and we're comfortable going and building that company. Okay. So one of the questions that came in, and I'm curious about this too, since Israel is so advanced in cybersecurity, are you working with any uh, former Israeli security people sure, or are you working sure, with some sure. Israeli startups? Yeah, so we, we, we definitely have Israeli startups. Um, if, if, you, if you look at the cyber innovation landscape on a global basis, um, I would say that 60 to 65% of cyber innovation originates in the U.S., um, after the U.S., number two would be Israel, uh, and that's probably 20 to maybe 25 percent of the innovation originates out of Israel. Um, the other, whatever's left, 10, let's call it 10 percent, is kind of rest of world. Uh, and and within rest of world, I would probably put the U.K. Uh, as as first in that rest of world. And you go back and you look at why does it develop that way? Part of it is where you've got these massive government investments in development of these technical capabilities in the name of, of national security. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the U.S., Israel, uh, the U.K. Now, China and Russia have massive national security cyber capabilities. But what they haven't, excuse me, what they haven't been able to do is really commercialize that expertise. That has not been their focus. Their focus has been the U outside of a couple of notable examples uh, out of Russia in particular. Um, they developed those capabilities as a tool of statecraft, uh, as a tool of national security. The focus wasn't on commercialization the way that it is in the West. So, but yeah, we, de we definitely have, uh, we definitely have Israeli uh, startup companies in our portfolio. Okay. And um, yeah, so there was a question here about the public markets too. Let me, uh, let me pick that one out. Um, the public markets have some use cases and low-hanging fruit. These are 10x opportunities. This is uh, someone um, chatting about. Are there any companies in the public market that have use cases and low-hanging fruit? These are 10x opportunities. Well, look, I, I think that um, you know CrowdStrike's had a great run, right? It's it's hard to imagine that there's a 10x on top of CrowdStrike where it is today. Uh, but who would have who would have guessed five years ago that CrowdStrike would be where it is today? You know, the, the, the challenge for public cyber companies is that, and there are some great ones, you know, Palo Alto's had a good run, Cisco's becoming more of a cyber company, uh, CrowdStrike's out there. Um, you know, there, there are a number of solid public cybersecurity companies, but they face the same challenge that big IT companies face and that the larger you get, the harder it is to maintain that pace of innovation to, to remain at the cutting edge of innovation. And look, in cyber, there, there are no trophies for second best. You're either world-class or you're not. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, marketing can only get you so far. Uh, and at the end of the day, you better have a better idea. It better work in a demonstrably superior way if you're going to scale that. That is harder to do as a public company. You look at, at you know, FireEye, how disruptive FireEye was when they went public. But then the transition they had to manage from on-prem to virtualized or cloud-based, trying to do all of that in a public environment uh, where you're held accountable on a quarterly basis, very, very difficult. Uh, and so I think there are companies out there, but my entire focus is on private companies because I like the odds better with private companies. I like, I like the ability to create value with private companies. Uh, you know, the challenge for the broader investing public is how do you access, you know, those private companies? It's it's right. difficult, right? There, it's through venture funds primarily, uh, or or maybe you get a friends and family opportunity from time to time. And I actually think a lot about that. I think about isn't there is there another way for us to innovate to provide access uh, to the broader investing public to private cyber companies? But that's just something that kind of rattles around in the back of my head. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. But but look, I mean, you look at what CrowdStrike's on. You know, George and uh, Dimitri, the co-founder of CrowdStrike sits on a board with me. 
uh, you know, George and Dimitri did a phenomenal job at CrowdStrike. And, and they, they, they really hit a seam, an innovation seam, where there was a transition taking place. I mean, they're principally, many people would describe them as an endpoint security company. There was no shortage of endpoint security companies. There were a dozen endpoint security companies. But they, they hit a, an innovation seam that allowed them to really innovate, again, over the horizon, an entirely new paradigm as it related to endpoint security. And they've written that phenomenally successfully. And I think, I think we'll see more of that. But the vast majority of cyber companies are going to get acquired uh, because that, that process of going from successful innovation, innovation with commercial validation to scaling is really, really hard. Uh, and, and frankly, it, it, that, that really is where you want guys like Dave DeWalt and the Night Dragon team you know, who, who have built big public cyber companies you know, and, and know what it takes and know where the people are to execute those plans. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're, you're, you're blind in the dark trying to find the path forward. I always, I always describe it, building a startup is, a, is akin to, you know, running through a minefield naked in the middle of the night. There's, there's two ways to get through that minefield. On your hands and knees, what I call the braille method, which is slow, uh, or you get a map. Uh, and, and, and then you can run through that minefield because you know where the mines are. So for me, in, in all things cyber, first of all, Go find a map, find an investor that's got a map that knows what they're doing, that live in this world, that have the resources, that know the customers. And that also applies from a stage perspective. You know, people that are really good at building things at an early stage. And if, you, if you're fortunate enough, you know, to get to that point where you're, you're looking at growth equity, it, it's not just capital. Many times, I think entrepreneurs make a mistake where it's just about who can give me the best deal, the best valuation, the least dilutive capital. That's important. But what is more important, in my humble opinion, and this is not where we play, so I, I have no dog in this hunt, is investors that can de-risk the process of rapidly scaling and growing a company. Um, and, you know, what, what, for me, whatever the cost of that expertise is, get the expertise, because that's the difference in your growth curve and your probability of success. And I don't, I don't think enough entrepreneurs, you know, I think, I think as entrepreneurs, having been one twice, um, I don't think we think about the path ahead and de-risking the path ahead as much as we should. And the importance of, of having those mentors or those experienced operators as investors who have, who have lived the entrepreneurial role, who have made all the mistakes, that can share the benefit of all those mistakes with you and help you de-risk your plan. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right now there's so much money in circulation. You know, I don't think anybody's kind of focused on those building block basics. But there's going to come a time in the not too distant future, these markets will reset. Uh, cyber will be affected, but it will be least, less affected because the macro will continue to grow for cyber. But I think we're, I think entrepreneurs are going to have to be a lot more focused on who their investors are and how do their investors help them get through that minefield in the middle of the night. Right. So you're helping these startups to get started and to get to a certain stage. And then if they want to go public or get acquired, they basically they're not going to be going, they'll be going, getting more investment from a different type of firm, then. Yeah, not yeah, your yeah. firm, but yeah. a different type of firm. So then how does that, where does that leave Allegis Cyber? Well, look, how do be, you, how do you exit then? What, well, how do I mean, you we, make we, money? Yeah, we're, look, we're, we're, we, well, you know, our approach is we have a universe of investors that we think know cyber that we've co-invested with. And we tend to work with that universe. Uh, because they're calibrated, it, it helps reduce our risk. We know what they can contribute to the success of the company. But if you go back and you look at our platform, we understand what Data Tribe does. Takes a concept and 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 cap, you know, basically brings a business out of that concept and gets it ready for the venture ecosystem. Um, and then a lead just steps in, and we bring our set of skills and our experience and our networks, and we get it to a point where the growth equity guys step in, and we have growth equity guys that have cyber expertise that we'll refer our companies to. And so there is a, there's an ecosystem of collaboration within cyber. Well, frankly, you know, those that have been doing it for a long time, we all know each other. Uh, we're used to working together, not, not at the expense of a startup, but to the benefit of, of a startup. I know that if I've got a company, if I've got a company like Dracos, then I said, this is going to be a public company, right? And I know what they need to do in order to become a public company. I want new investors at the table that can help de-risk that process. 
that can bring expertise, that can bring relationships and resources that help Dragos continue on their journey towards a, uh, towards a public company. That's in my interest at Allegis. That's in our interest at Data Tribe where Dragos began. If we're doing our job, that's what we should be thinking about. I mean, I saw a good friend of mine did a survey. Um, I don't know, it was uh, another, another cyber venture guy uh, of, of what is, what is, the, what is the, the job of venture capitalists and just trying to get a sense of the market. You know, and, and the list was something like, well, provide capital, uh, be a mentor. Uh, and, and it was like 85% of the respondents says was to provide capital. And, and I looked at that and said, man, how far we have fallen. That is not the job. Uh, ca capital is something that comes along with our expertise, but our job is to partner with an entrepreneur, roll up our sleeves, share the benefit of our experience, good and bad, with the entrepreneur to help de-risk their journey through that minefield. That's what venture capital is about. If you go back to the origins of the venture capital committee, as an entrepreneur, I was backed by, I was backed by Sequoia and I was backed by NEA. Uh, and I was backed, I'm, I'll date myself, I was backed by the early Sequoia guys, uh, who are actually the ones that encouraged me to get into venture. They're all hardcore operating guys, hardcore operating guys. And their ability to add value around the board table versus very smart guys that, did, that didn't have that operating background, night and day, night and day. And the earlier you are as a startup, the more important it is to have those investors that have walked a mile in your moccasins, that know what it is to wake up at two o'clock in the morning and going, how in the hell do I make payroll next month? That's, that's, that's the reality of a startup, right? And you want investors sitting at your table that have been on that journey, that understand that pain, that understand the fear and have already worked through what are the options available to me? How do I think about this? How do I prioritize? Yeah. You know, that turns out to be a competitive advantage. Yeah. And I don't think within the venture community, we give nearly enough credit or place nearly enough value on that experience and that expertise when we're building companies. So you take a board seat on these companies? Yeah, we're we're on we're on the board of all of our companies. You're we're on the board of all of them, and then yeah, we're we're a, we're a we're a very active investor. So. Oh, okay, and what kind of equity stake do you take normally on average? Well, it, it, it depends. I mean, if it, you know, it's all kind of stage dependent. So you know, when we go in, look, when when Data Tribe starts a company, and again, it, it's 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 three guys and or gals and a dog in a garage, right, looking for a direction. Um, and, and Data Tribe will own 30% of a company, 35% of a company, sometimes a little bit more. Uh, but the Data Tribe model is not just capital. You know, it, it's, you know, our, our Data Tribe investments are usually a million and a half to $2 million to get things started. But we put another million to a million and a half in, in, in soft services in kind for no equity. They don't pay rent. They don't pay for any of our people. Uh, we, do, we do recruiting on our nickel. So we put a combination of hard dollars to soft dollars in. When you get to Allegis, um, you know, if, if you're looking at kind of series A, you know, we're probably, we're, we're probably thinking plus or minus 20%. Uh, when you get up to series C, we're thinking plus or minus 10%. Uh, you know, just very broad generalizations. And that's not unique mm -hmm. to us. It's just kind of how the, how the venture ecosystem works. Um, you know, our, our job is to go in early, write a meaningful check, take a meaningful piece of equity, roll up our sleeves and become part of the team. Uh, right. and, and help them build value uh, and get it to a place where we can then take them to other investors that we trust, that we respect, that we think have complementary skills and personalities, you know, and temperaments. You know, we have, we have a style. We're hardcore operators. So we have a style in terms of what we want to see, you know, in our syndicate partners. And we prepare our companies uh, so that we can go with them and say, look, we have something we really believe in here. We think it's a quality team the quality opportunity. Here's the vision that we see. Here's what we've done. Here's why we think you would be a good fit for it. But that also means you've got investors that have the credibility, have the relationships, have the trust within the investor community. So you're kind of all sharing this information around about who's the next big hot company and well, I mean, it's, how much it's, you should invest and should you co-invest? Well, I think, I mean, look, there's a lot of collaboration because most investing is done in syndicates, right? So people have to share information. Uh, just the way a, a startup, if it wants to raise the next round of financing. But even in this whole cybersecurity area. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it comes down, A, you operate within a circle of trust. Uh, you know, with, with, within the cyber community, there's early stage, there's probably 10 people I work with. Uh, 
uh, it's, it's a pretty small circle, right? And these are people I've worked with for 15 years. We know each other, we trust each other, we're calibrated. Um, uh, you know, we, we, are not, we are not free and open with the proprietary information of our companies. That does not happen. But when a company goes to raise money, you know, it's gonna have to provide certain information to investors. And we wanna, we wanna help our companies prepare that information so that it will be shared in a way where it will be understood and it will be appreciated and it will be valued. And then we want to make those trusted introductions where I can call somebody that I, that I trust a lot and say, Hey, you know, we've done those last three companies together. We think this is worth you taking a look at. Mm -hmm. Now they're not always going to agree, but I would, you know, people, a lot of times people, entrepreneurs come in and say, Hey, can you make introductions to me for me to other investors? And I said, well, in cybersecurity, that's my wheelhouse. I don't really think about the rest of the world, but be careful when you ask me for an introduction. Uh, if, if I am going to invest in your company or I'm seriously looking at investing in your company, I'll make those introductions because I'm looking to bring somebody else in who's complimentary that will help me help you to de-risk the execution. If I'm not going to invest, don't ask me for an introduction because the first thing that's going to happen is, Bob, are you going to do this one? And me saying no to a cybersecurity company raises all sorts of flags. Yeah. So. So, so, you know, as an entrepreneur, like I, I used to teach new venture finance at Berkeley in the MBA program. And I would always tell my class, I said, you know, the best introduction to a, to a prospective investor is a warm introduction from somebody they trust. Because that gets you from, you know, the, the stack of papers to the top of the stack of papers, which is where you want to be. Because yeah. the bottom and the middle never gets, yeah. right? Sure. But, but you want to make sure that when you're right. getting that warm introduction, you're getting it from somebody who's seriously engaged that is going to, you're going to be able to borrow some of their brand equity, some of their credibility with that investor they're introducing you to. Right. If they're going to make an introduction and say, yeah, it's not for us. Now, there might be a really good reason. I think this is pretty cool, but I got a competitive company. Fair enough. Or it's at a stage that's not appropriate for us. That's why I'm sending it to you. But if it's a really, really good deal, why are you sharing it with me if you're not going to do it? Yeah, it just, it just raises all sorts of red flags. Yeah. Because remember, the venture committee, venture capitalists have, have, have the attention spans of gnats, right? I mean, they have, they have absolutely no attention span whatsoever. And, and, and so you need to understand that and you need to understand, okay, how do I navigate in that environment to get to the top of the stack, to get seriously listened to, but also means targeting your investors very carefully. I can't tell you how many times I get, I get you know, I've gotten, I don't know, in the last month, I've gotten like 45 referrals. Um, you know, which is, which is a pretty big number. Um, and what do I do? I look at who the referral come from. Is it somebody that I trust or respect? Those go to the top of the list. If it's somebody that came over the, over the transom, I'm probably not going to get to it, unfortunately, because my, my, my most precious commodity is time. And so I'm looking at how do I arbitrage opportunity against time that I have available. Right. But when, when I get those, those introductions saying, <clears throat> based on your extensive in, in, investing in financial services, we, we knew you'd be interested in this. It's like, well, I don't do financial services. <clears throat> so yeah, don't, don't do I, that. I get a lot of queries like that when people want me to write about their company. Yeah. Oh, based upon your great writing on the so-and-so. Um, but anyhow, are there any other questions out there? So, um, uh, Bob, um, yeah, this has been really enlightening. Uh, do you ever work with, uh, say, the Air Force Research Lab because they have such a huge budget and they're trying to we, outreach to other, you know, outside we, the gate? I mean, I mean, we in, we in our companies, because of what we do, um, you know, there are there are a number of really pretty interesting programs that come out of the government, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in, in and around innovation. So we certainly get plugged into those. Um, because again, okay, we're so all about cutting military out. as well. Then. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Because look, I mean, where, where does the, where does the NSA sit? The NSA sits inside of the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. right? So, so absolutely. And and again, how do we view the NSA? We view the NSA as an R and D shop with a massive okay. doing cutting edge work. I That's see. It. So. I see. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, are there any other questions out there, Bob? Do you have to? You. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your own background. Do you have to be a technologist to kind of understand all this? Well, I think, I think, it, I think it helps to tell you God's honest truth. Um, so my background is computer science. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I do have a technical background. It's a dated technical background at this point in time. I've, I've maintained my, yeah. my foundations and my architectural understanding, which is appropriate to being a venture capitalist. Um, 
but I, 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 uh, I built a couple of startups. So I ran, uh, I, I built one of the, one of the two leading Unix systems houses uh, in the world uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a very young CEO and learned a lot about growing a business to just to date myself. Uh, this was a point in time where I was a software company and the venture community wasn't sure about investing in software, uh, including my friends at Sequoia, uh, who said, why don't you go, why don't you go do a venture fund, Bob? We'll, we'll, we'll help you set that up. Um, and so I did that, which gave me a lot of experience, a 29 year old CEO with operations around the world, building a business out of cash flow. learned a lot about building a business that way. No venture capital, all out of cash flow. Uh, and that company was built in Berkeley, California with the, uh, the core of the BSD team for people that remember Unix. Uh, and then I, uh, I started another company called InfoGear, which is where we built the original uh, iPhones. Uh, and uh, that was based on a small R&D project at National Semiconductor that I ran into. And I pulled the technology out and we actually uh, coined iPhone and iPad and owned those trademarks. And uh, you oh. know, this is pre-wireless, uh, but the, 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 the model that we use today, the architectural model we use today, uh, for smartphones and smart devices is what we pioneered. Had a lot of intellectual property, ended up uh, selling that company. That was backed by NEA. Uh, and uh, Dick Kramlick was on my board and uh, we ended up selling that company uh, to Cisco. So if, you, if anybody goes back in their Wayback Machine and remembers Apple launching the iPhone, they'll remember there's a little, little dust up between Apple and Cisco over the use of iPhone and iPad. Uh, that's because those trademarks were Cisco's. As, as was the seminal patent. We had the seminal patent for the integration of web and telephony. Uh, that was our core patent. And that patent actually was at Cisco, not at Apple. And Apple uh, did a really, really good job building a lot of IP around that core patent. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there, so that's my background. But just al along the way, my experience with venture capitalists, I just, early on, I developed an opinion that the best venture capitalists were ones that had operating backgrounds. That was my own, you know, that was my own bias as an ex-operator. And yeah. uh, with the encouragement of the guys from Sequoia, it's like, Bob, you should jump into venture. And, uh, you know, they, hey, we'll, we'll help you with a C fund if that's what you want to do. And I actually chose to partner with another group because uh, I had some ideas about how venture could be done a little bit differently. And uh, that, that launched my career. That was uh, in venture. That was, uh, that was 1996. So. Okay. Well, Bob, we go way back. Uh, like, we do. We do. Yeah, so it's really good to connect with you again here, and thank you so much for all your ideas. You got a lot of fans who are here who are listening in, and they say, "Oh, you always have such refreshingly good ideas," and uh, that's wonderful. Uh, so let's um, let's just say a few extra words here to end us uh, to end us for this evening uh, or this morning if you're somewhere else. Um, so uh, we actually didn't get to our poll tonight because Bob was so interesting. Uh, we didn't even get to it. Um, yeah, you got to shut me up. Next <laughs> week. Uh, no, I, you know, I, I really learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else did. Uh, so next week, we have Jim Robinson of RRE Ventures. He's here in New York, and he's going to be on Tuesday, 4 p.m. Pacific time. So I hope you that you'll all tune in then and... Uh, thank you all for joining us. Appreciate your questions. And uh, thank you again, Bob. A real pleasure, Rebecca. Anytime. You know that. Yeah, real pleasure. Uh, okay. See you around. See you in person sometime. Okay. Wyoming. Come on. <laughs> Wyoming. Wyoming. Okay. Goodbye. Take care, Rebecca. Goodbye. Bye. Now. Bye.